thank you everyone for, for joining. Uh, good, good morning or good evening, depending on where you're joining from. Uh, I want to thank you all for, for joining us after some time off at the beginning of the year. We're excited to relaunch our webinar series. Uh, this is our 52nd webinar in our series. So it's good to see some familiar faces on the registration list. Thank you for coming back. And to those of you that are new to the series, it's my pleasure to welcome you to our online community of researchers. We know how valuable your time is. There's a lot of webinars, conferences, training sessions, and meetings that are competing for your time. So we appreciate you spending some time with us. We have two presenters today from the Materials Science and Engineering Department at Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands. The title of today's presentation is Cleavage Fracture Micromechanisms in Simulated Heat Affected Zones of S90 High Strength Steels. High strength steels are widely used for structural applications where a combination of excellent strength and ductile to brittle transition properties are required. However, such a combination of high strength and toughness can be deteriorated in the heat affected zone after welding. The work behind this presentation aims to develop a relationship between microstructure and cleavage fracture in the most brittle areas of welded S690 high strength structures. Our first presenter is Virginia Bertolo, who obtained her PhD from Delft University of Technology earlier this year and is currently a postdoc researcher at TU Delft and Ghent University in a project of the Materials Innovation Institute. Her background is in mechanical behavior of metallic materials and her research interests involve fracture micromechanisms of complex engineering materials and their relationship in their microstructure and damage evolution. Our second presenter is Chen Xin Jiang, who also obtained her PhD from Delft University of Technology earlier this year and is currently working as a credit risk model validator. Her background is in statistical modeling methods to make predictions and assist decision making about the real world. As always, we will endeavor to keep this webinar to one hour or less. We will have time for a live Q&A at the end of the presentation. And additionally, since the presentation is pre-recorded, Virginia is also available to answer lot, uh, questions during the webinar live. Uh, so ask if you have questions, please ask them using the, the, the chat feature here in the, the webinar software. Uh, if you type in a question, uh, Virginia will be able to type in a response. Uh, and uh, time permitting, we should have time at the end. We'll also select some of those questions and Virginia can address them live. Video of this presentation will be available online soon and certificates will be emailed to you if you are listening to this live. You'll be able to find a link to this video as well as videos of past webinars by going to our website at Gleeble.com. And then if you click on the resources link at the, in the top navigation bar, uh, there's a drop down and you click on webinars and there you can view past webinars. Again, there's, this is our 52nd webinar, so there's a lot of them up there. Uh, and you can also sign up for future webinars. Uh, our next webinar will be next month. Uh, we'll be announcing that shortly. Uh, so look for an email, uh, probably from me or someone on our team here. I will announce the date and the topic, uh, but you can also check that webinar page. Uh, uh, in a few weeks, we'll have, uh, or a couple of weeks, we'll have that link up there as well. But without further delay, I do want to hand this over to our presenters. Uh, and then again, if you have questions, uh, enter them in the chat and we will uh, we'll address them. Uh, we'll give Virginia a chance to address them live. And uh, I will talk to you all in a little bit. See, I'm having a little trouble sharing the video here. We're there. We go. Thank you, then, for in the invitation to present our work in this global webinar, and also for the introduction. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for attending our presentation on cleavage fracture micromechanisms and simulated heat affected zones of S690 high strength steels. So, I would like to start this presentation by explaining. What is the motivation behind our study? Why to study cleavage fracture in high strength steels and their welded structures? Well, high strength steels are used as uh, yeah as a material to produce structures such as for offshore installation and decommissioning structures. And the severe service conditions of high stress, high strain rates, and potential of very low temperatures raises concerns about structural safety with respect to cleavage fracture. And this is attributed to the fact that cleavage fracture is the intrinsic failure mode of BCC metals, 
under these conditions. And as it's known, BCC metals transition from ductile to brittle fracture with the reduction of temperature. And then, uh, for instance, when we have uh, a, a, a structure applied in Arctic waters where surface temperatures down to minus 70 degrees Celsius are reached, high stream steels are usually in service at the ductile to brittle transition temperature range. And this is already sufficient to be critical since the cleavage contribution in the failure process may lead the structure to fail in a sudden and catastrophic way. And of course, as a consequence of brittle fracture, we, uh, we also have the social and environmental impacts. According to the literature, cleavage fracture process takes place in three sequential steps. So initially, a cleavage crack nucleates and extends in a hard particle as a result of its location pileup. Then the hard particle crack propagates through the boundary between the particle and the matrix grain. And subsequently, the grain-sized crack uh, propagates through the grain boundaries into the adjacent grain. However, this cleavage fracture process that I just described it for you is general and oversimplified. The actual microstructure and structural high stream steels is very complex. Uh, it comprises a mix of multiple phases and microstructural features as inclusions, carbides, and segregation bands. And in the case of welded structures, MA constituents and other phases may also be present. And then when we talk about welded parts of these structures, the microstructure becomes even more complex with multiple areas uh, with poor toughness microstructures called heat affected zones, which also brings concerns in terms of safety and structural reliability. Then if we try to fit the microstructure that we have into the failure micromechanisms described in the literature, it's very challenging. There are many questions that can be posed here. For instance, which of the brittle particles will nucleate the crack, inclusions, uh, carbides, MA constituents, and to which grain and phase the crack will preferentially propagate. So if you have different phases, you don't know, uh, well, it depends on many aspects. And then the research goal of this project was to establish a cleavage fracture criterion uh, for failure prediction in welded multi-phase high stream steel structures. So uh, now giving more details of this research, the material that we investigated is a quenched and tempered S690 high stream steel. And we use the global uh, thermomechanical simulator to mimic the most critical heat affected zones for fracture according to the literature. So uh, one of uh, these heat affected zones is the coarse granite heat affected zone. And the other ones are the intercritically heat rated coarse granite heat affected zones. And here we have uh, two different peak temperatures. We have the 750 degrees Celsius and the 800 degrees Celsius. We started by characterizing the microstructure of each heat affected zone by scanning electron microscopy, so SEM, electron, electron backscatter diffraction, uh, EBSD, and microbeakers hardness. Then we performed tensile tests at room temperature and to convert these properties at room temperature to the test temperature that we wanted, uh, we used the British standard 7410. And one important aspect that is important to mention is that the cross-section area of the tensile specimens was reduced in 50% in the heat treated area in order to concentrate the stresses in this area and ensure that the properties of each simulated heat affected zone would be obtained. 
And then uh, finally, uh, the characterization of the fracture behavior was done by a subsized three point banding pass at minus 40 degrees Celsius. And later, the fracture surfaces were analyzed by SEM and EBSG to study the nucleation and propagation micromechanisms. Okay, so now let's talk about the results. And here, the results for the coarse granite heat affected zone and the intercritically heat rated coarse granite heat affected zones will be presented, discussed, and we will also compare to the as received condition of the high strength steel. As can be seen here in these pictures, all investigated heat affected zones have a complex microstructure that is composed of a mixture of various phases. Starting from the coarse granite heat affected zone, we see that it's composed of fresh martensite, out of tempered martensite, and coalesced martensite. For both intercritically heat rated coarse granite heat affected zones, at seven, uh, 750 degrees Celsius and 800, the microstructure includes fresh martensite, auto tempered martensite, bionetic ferrite, Randler bainite, and polygonal ferrite. Furthermore, we can clearly see this in the pictures a necklace structure at the pryosnite grain boundaries. Uh, is observed in the intercritically heat rated coarse granite heat affected zone. And this same structure is also often observed inside the browsnite grains. And from the SEM uh, pictures and the EBSG investigation, this structure decorating the browsnite grain boundaries is composed of auto tempered martensite and MA constituents. These phases were quantified to allow us to better understand later the properties results. And in a previous study of our group, we had seen that the base material is composed of tempered martensite, tempered bainite, and ferrite. And in this case uh, of, our, uh, of our base material, tempered bainite represents the majority followed by tempered martensite. But uh, the nano-hardness measurements that we performed showed that tempered martensite and tempered bainite, which make up uh, more than 90% of the base material, present similar properties. So here we are not distinguishing between them. And for the heat-affected zones, the phases that are found in the majority are out of tempered martensite for the coarse granite heat affected zones. And uh, it makes the coarse granite heat affected zone to be composed of more than 90% of out of tempered martensite. And for the intercritically coarse granite heat affected zone at 750 and 800 degrees Celsius, uh, the majority uh, of the microstructure is composed of granular bainite, so it corresponds to more than 70%. Moreover, uh, the studied heat affected zones inherited other microstructural features from their base material, such as circular and cubic inclusions, and uh, their parameters, such as size and area fraction, were kept the same after the thermal simulations by Eclibo. And another microstructural feature observed for the base material was uh, the segregation beds. And in these specific cases, uh, case, we did observe differences in the chemical composition of uh, the segregation beds after the thermal simulations, where the, there was a general reduction of manganese, chromium, and molybdenum content in the segregation bands of the heat affected zones compared to the base material. Um, in terms of uh, fracture behavior, spe is specifically uh, about the heat affected zones, we know that grain size and MA constituents are the key factors affecting fracture toughness. 
and uh, to better understand later the, uh, the the mechanical and fracture properties, these features were characterized and quantified. Here we start from the Prowse night grain uh, sizes. Uh, the reconstructed Prowse night grain sizes for the simulated heat, heat affected zones, they show the non equiaxed grain morphology. And for this reason, we have measured the grain size in terms of grain width and grain length. And the results indicate that the heat affected zones have larger Prowse night grain sizes than the base material which is, of course, attributed to the large temperatures reached during the thermal cycle of the coarse granite heat affected zone, and also the first cycle of the intercritically heat rated coarse granite heat affected zones. And among the, the heat affected zones, the coarse granite heat affected zone has a smaller cryosnite grain size than the intercritically heat rated coarse granite heat affected zones. But it's important to mention that the large scatter presented in the intercritically heat-rated coarse grain heat affected zones, uh, they, yeah, it demonstrates that there is a heterogeneous distribution of grain sizes within the samples, uh, which is not expected to be generated by the intercritical cycle. And uh, it means that this large scatter indicates that the larger prosnite grain sizes in their intercritical, uh, intercritically heat-rated coarse granite heat affected zones may be due to a sampling effect, uh, so being statistically insufficient for an accurate comparison. So we cannot really say that the intercritically coarse granite heat affected zones have larger Prowsenite grain sizes than the coarse granite heat affected zones. Finally, in terms of MA constituents, this table that we have in the slide summarizes the area fraction of MA constituents for each heat affected zone, uh, their respective average MA length, and their number fraction of slender and small MA constituents. So, the quantitative analysis indicates that the intercritically coarse granite heat affected zone at 750 degrees Celsius has the highest volume fraction of MA, so 14%, followed by the intercritically heat rated coarse granite heat affected zone at 800 degrees Celsius in 6%, and the coarse granite heat affected zone with the lowest area fraction, about 4%. Uh, the coarse granite heat affected zone have similar fraction between slender and blocky MA constituents, while the intercritically heat rated coarse granite heat affected zones, the majority are the blocky MAs. In terms of size, all heat affected zones have a majority of small MA constituents with average MA length smaller than one micron. And this is in good agreement with the literature, because in general, MA constituents in the coarse granite heat affected zone are either not present or present in a small fraction. And this is attributed to the very high peak temperatures, uh, where the higher the temperature, the larger the carbon diffusion and less stable austenite is at room temperature then the MA constituent content decreases at higher temperatures. And these explain the largest area fraction of MAs present in intercritically heat-rated coarse granite heat affected zone at 750, followed by the 850, uh, sorry, 800 degrees Celsius, and then the coarse granite heat affected zone. Another important aspect of MAs is the morphology. There are MAs with uh, internal substructures and sparsely distributed austenitic parts. And these are the ones that we see highlighted by the uh, black rectangle here in these pictures. And uh, MAs with no internal substructures and dense austenitic parts. And these are the ones highlighted by 
the yellow uh, circles here. And uh, these morphologies, they influence the amount of internal geometrically necessary dislocations of this MAs, as well as their internal plastic strength, as can be seen here in these pictures in the bottom row uh, in the kernel average misorientation maps. The CAM, so the kernel average misorientation level, and consequently, the geometrically necessary dislocation density and the degree of plastic strain uh, varies uh, depending on MA morphology. We observed that the MA constituents with no internal substructure uh, and dense alternative parts have low kernel average misorientation level. So they're mostly green. And on the other hand, the MA constituents with internal substructures and sparsely distributed austenite have high CAM, so a red color. And the highest values are associated predominantly with the austenitic areas. We now start to connect the microstructure with the mechanical and fracture properties of the investigated heat affected zones. And here in this plot, you can see the microbeaker's hardness, uh, the HV3, at, well, measured at room temperature, and the tensile properties at minus 40 degrees Celsius. Uh, as can be seen, the coarse granite heat affected zone stands out as the harder and stronger heat affected zone, which also impacts the fracture toughness. So, the highest hardness and the highest tensile properties of the coarse granite heat affected zone also presents, uh, well, also leads to the lowest fracture toughness. And this is the this is contrary to what is reported in the literature, where in general the intercritically heated zone uh, is the most embrittled area due to the larger content of MA constituents and also um, with yeah, with the decoration along the prior alsnite grain boundaries in the in a necklace uh, necklace like form, and when we look at the fracture surface, we see that MA constituents are the likely features triggering fracture in all heat affected zones, which means that the difference between the fracture toughness of heat affected zones is not related to MA constituents, then it's likely that the difference in cleavage fracture behavior between heat affected zones is attributed to the matrix. What happens is that as previously presented in the MA constituents, uh, well, sorry, as previously presented, um, the MA constituents are small, uh, with average length is smaller than one micron. And this means that they are not sufficiently large for stable, uh, unstable failure. Then the crack propagation step through the matrix will be the determinant process to achieve the critical crack length. Therefore, the properties of the matrix uh, play a major role. Uh, the phases present in the coarse granite heat affected zone uh, are much harder than the matrix of the intercritically heated coarse granite heat affected zone. So we are talking about uh, 440 compared to 330. And then uh, the harder matrix uh, make it easier for the crack to propagate, resulting in lower fracture toughness. In terms of crack propagation, the transverse section of the fracture surfaces were analyzed and by using the 3D lattice cubes, uh, we observed that the crack preferentially propagates through the 110 and 100 cleavage planes. And within each prior grain, uh, as uh, separated here in the, in the figure, uh, we separated the blocks, packets, and bang axis. And we then concluded that the Krausnite grain boundaries and packets and block boundaries with different neighboring axes 
effectively deflect the threat. And what was also an important uh, observation is that the necklace is structured around, around the prosnite brain, um, around the prosnite brain boundary, do not play a role and MA constituents are rarely observed in the main threat type. One important and interesting uh, characteristic of the heat affected zones in this study that was not reported in the literature is the multiple popping behavior in the low displacement curves for most of the tested specimens. And there is no clear reason for multiple poppings uh, in the direct analysis of the fracture surfaces. So for instance, by uh, if we have a surrounding tougher material or by the initiation of cracks perpendicular to the plane of the initial crack uh, that are also called delamination or splitting, uh, we didn't observe any of these. But another possibility is the existence of secondary cracks. So on the transverse section of the fracture surface, we observed that secondary cracks were deflected and arrested in only certain MA constituents. And this was observed specifically in MA constituents with internal high angle substructure boundaries and internal plastic strings. Uh, what happens is that when a crack interacts with uh, the MA constituents with high plastic strain, uh, it affects the crack tip stresses, uh, stress state, reducing the stress intensity and therefore the criticality uh, ahead of the crack, explaining the crack deflections and also the crack arrest events. Furthermore, the literature also shows that the internal substructures of MA constituents include high angle boundaries, which can also change the direction of a crack or hinder it. So uh, in conclusion, we observed that while the microstructural feature triggering fracture in all analyzed heat affected zones is MA constituents, but they are too small for unstable fracture. So in this case, the matrix and its properties determines the toughness of the material. Uh, we also observed that the crack propagates transgranularly and MA constituents are not observed in the main crack path, while the prosnite grain boundaries in the packets and block boundaries with different neighboring vein axes are the ones that effectively divert the crack, uh, the cleavage crack. And finally, the multiple poppings uh, that we observed in the low displacement curves result from the interaction of the crack with MA constituents, specifically the ones with internal substructures and high internal plastic strength. And these uh, MAs are able to deflect and arrest cracks as a result of uh, the reduction of crack tip stresses due to the compressive stresses inside MA constituents and the high angle boundaries of substructures. And translating the previously presented and discussed results to a cleavage fracture criterion of heat affected zones, uh, we can say that the crack nucleation takes place at MA constituents, but the determinant step in the fracture process is the crack propagation. So uh, with the crack propagation, the crack is able to achieve the critical crack length, and it strongly depends on the matrix properties. As uh, explained, the crack propagates transgranularly through the 001 and 110 cleavage planes, and it deflects at high angle grain boundaries, such as uh, prosnite grain uh, boundaries, and at high angle substructures uh, boundaries with different bang axes, so packets and blocks with different neighboring bang axes. And we also observed that the crack deflects and arrests at MA with high internal grain boundaries, uh, substructures, and high internal plastic deformation. So, um, 
the research contribution that we have in this project is that we develop a microstructure based for, uh, failure criterion of ha for high stream steels of a commercially available high stream steel. And this allows the prediction of their fracture behavior at low temperature applications concerning structural safety. And this in depth microstructural and fracture characterization represents a unique combination of microstructural parameters which are necessary for understanding and modeling the continuum level properties. And this last point leads us to the next presentation by Funxin Jung on the modeling side of the research. Thank you very much. I'm Jason Zhang. Thank you for the invitation to Dribble webinar. To continue with Virginia's presentation, I would like to introduce how the measured data are used in numerical model that we further study the cleavage fracture in heat affected zones. Our motivation is to simulate macroscopic fracture toughness from local fracture behavior and from statistical representation of microstructures. After Dribble simulated heat treatment, we are able to directly measure the change in microstructures, but it is very challenging to directly measure the change in local fracture behavior. So we want to compare the simulation with fracture toughness measured by experiments and use inverse analysis to determine the parameter represent local fracture behavior. In that way, we would be able to thoroughly study the effect of heat treatment. The model is based on micro mechanism of cleavage. There are three criteria need to be satisfied simultaneously before the cleavage occurring in the material. So first, the stress at a brittle particle need to be um, need to be greater than a threshold that the particle will be broken and form a micro crack. The micro crack is then of the size of this particle, and depending on the local stress level. It needs to be uh, greater than a critical value to propagate across the particle and matrix interface. Then the micro crack is of the size of the grain. And also, depending on the local stress level, it needs need to be larger than a certain value to propagate across the grain boundary. So when we compare the uh, heat treated material with the as received material, we assume the cleavage parameter for the uh, particle breaking and for the particle matrix interface will remain the same. But for the uh, green boundary, uh, the local toughness of the green boundary, we will use inverse analysis to fit the value for the heat treated materials. There are three randomness in this micro mechanism that cannot be ignored. So first, the hard particle has a, a random random distribution in the material, so the stress will be different for different location in the specimen. The hard particles are also observed to have different uh, shape and size, and we measure the grain size as the uh, size of the pre grains from EBSD map, and it also shows a randomness in the size distribution. Our model represents the cleavage event as a cleavage probability at a certain load. At micro scale, we simulate the cleavage probability in terms of the stress level. And by use finite element analysis, we are able to calculate the stress and strain distribution around the crack tip. After doing integral of, uh, of the cleavage probability near the uh, crack tip based on those uh, finite element, we are able to calculate the total cleavage probability for the specimen at a global load. And in this presentation, we use crack tape opening dis displacement to represent the global load. After heat treatment, we will have the material cross grain heat effect zone and intercritical cross grain heat effect zone. So for these two types of heat effect zones, the grain size will be more than three times larger than in the as received material. 
Another change is amatocin tunes appear after the heat treatment. The flow stress will also be higher in the heat affect zones as the phase of the matrix is also changed. We measure green sites from EBSD map and we use a function to represent the statistical distribution of the green sites. This function is then used with the criteria for the crack propagation. By combining the uh, green, si green size distribution, the uh, cleavage criteria, and the uh, local stress level calculated from finite element analysis, we are able to calculate the cleavage probability at a certain stress level for a finite element element. And finally, we can also calculate the cleavage probability at a certain CTUV level. So for the S received material and the heat effect zone, we compare our simulation with the measured data. So here, the measured CTUD and the simulated fracture behavior are all um, represented by a cleavage uh, probability at certain level of CTUD. Then we use inverse analysis to fit the cleavage parameter for the green boundary. So this parameter represents the local toughness of green boundary. And when we compare the value between the S received steel and the heat effect zone, we can see the value is much larger for the heat effect zones. And it will represent a more effective crack arrest in the crack operation. So here is the overview of the change after heat treatment. For both the uh, cross green heat effect zone and the intercritical cross green heat effect zone, the material has uh, higher flow stress and higher and larger green size. These two factors are both detrimental to cleavage fracture toughness. So the uh, CTUD value is as expected lower after the heat treatment. However, in the simulation, we found the cleavage parameter for the green boundary is also increased, which represents more crack arrest events. The experiment of experimental observations support this finding. So, for example, when we looked at low displacement curve during the fracture tests, we found there are multiple poplins that are not observed in the hit, uh, in the as received material. And when we uh, see the, when we analyze the MA constant tunes, we see that some MA constant tunes uh, at the path of the secondary crack they have uh, much higher residual stress because those residual stress are in compression, so they offers um, more resistance to the crack propagation. So the conclusion is. For the heat effect zone, we found the fitted value of the uh, local toughness for green boundary is more than 40% higher for heat effect zone. It represents more effective resistance to micro crack propagation. And this value is lower for the intercritical, uh, intercritical cross green heat effect zone compared to the cross green heat effect zone. The hypothesis to explain this phenomena is the reduction of crack tip stress due to the residual compressive stress in MA constituents. Thank you for watching the presentation. If you have further questions, my colleague Virginia will be happy to answer the question and have discussion with you. Great. Uh, thank you to our presenters. I really appreciate that. Uh, we do have a few questions that have already been asked. Uh, Virginia looks like you've. Uh, Virginia is a great typer and that typed up a long response. Uh, let's just test your microphone, Virginia. Are you able to hear me? Let me show. I can yes. Hear can you. you hear me? I can. Thank you. Great presentation. We appreciate it. Thank you. Um, one thing here. There's uh, usually a question about the presentation slides, so I am sharing a link. You, uh, people can download a PDF of both presentations. Uh, it's in one. PDF. I just put the link in the chat area uh, so people can, can use that link. Uh, also, that link will be sent out in a follow-up email that will go out uh, following the, the webinar. Uh, so 
Virginia, thank you for, for answering the questions. It looks like there's a couple of them here. Now we have a, a room full, uh, virtually a room full of Gleeble users. So some of the questions will, uh, of course, are gonna be about the Gleeble testing that you did here. It looks like you did answer uh, one of the questions uh, talking about specimens. Um, and one of the questions, it's, uh, the first one was, uh, did you use Sharpie bars? So maybe just ask you to elaborate a little bit. Uh, you did not use those specimens. Uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about why you didn't. Yes, sure. Uh, thank you, Brian, for your question. So as I mentioned, uh, we didn't focus on Sharpie and there are some reasons for that. So first, Sharpie is used more for a quali uh, qualification of the material for the industry because it's a simpler test. Uh, but the the property that you obtain depends on the size and the geometry of the specimen, for example, and uh, it doesn't represent the actual material property because of this. Also, the conditions that these tests are performed do not represent the actual um, situation of actual structures. For example, the very high strain rates. It doesn't represent the actual uh, strain rate that the structures experience in the application. So that's why we didn't use the, the Sharpie uh, specimens. Great, thank you. And then also we had a question about the, uh, the specimens that you did use and, and you talked a little bit about the thermal gradient uh, and talking about homogeneously how uh, you heat treated them. Uh, so can you maybe just describe that a little bit more as well? You did type up a nice response. Um, yes. Well. yes, of course. Uh, so uh, the only difference between the machining a specimen for a uh, base material and for the heat treated material uh, in the Glebo, it's because uh, is the, the fact that we perform it first, the heat treatment, and then we place it the notch. But of course, we also need to guarantee that the crack will propagate and be, well, the material will be tested within this homogeneously heat treated uh, microstructure. So for this, to measure what is the size of this uh, homogeneously heat treated uh, microstructure, we work it with uh, four thermocouples. So we place it two uh, in the center, but one in the front and one in the back. So in this way, we guarantee that uh, from one side to the other, we have a homogeneous microstructure. And we place it uh, one thermocouple 2.5 millimeters and another one five millimeters far away from the central one. And we observe it that the 2.5 millimeter away uh, had a very good correlation of temperature with the one in the center. Uh, but the one five millimeter away had a discrepancy like a, a, of 70 degrees. So we don't consider this as a homogene homogeneously heat treated area. And in this case, we consider that uh, if you have 2.5 millimeter on one side, so for example, on the right side and one on the left, then we have a five millimeter um, uh, homogeneously heat treated area. Great, thank you. Yeah, I saw, well, sorry, just a correction because I saw that in the chat, I wrote 10 millimeter, but it's five millimeter. Okay, great, thank you. So you can also see some of the questions coming in here. There's actually three of them. Uh, we will start with the first one, the how does, what are the effects of PAGS size and MA constituents related? And there's, it looks like there's a follow-up question there as well. Uh, if you can, if you see them, if you can answer maybe those two questions. Yes. Uh, so I don't think the effects of Prowse night grain size and MA constituents are related. Like they have the well separate effects. According to the literature, the larger the area fraction of MA, the worse will be the performance of your material. But we already saw here that it's not so simple like this. It depends on the size of your MA as well. And depending on the morphology of the MA, the behavior of the crack, if the crack interacts with the MA, will be different. And the Prowse and I grain size, well, this is more or less a common knowledge. 
So if you have a smaller grain size, your material will be tougher. And if you have coarser grain size, your material will not, well, it will be the other way around. The, the toughness will be lower. And uh, how volume fractions of MA constituents were measured? Yes, so it was from EBSD. Uh, with the use of image quality maps, we, uh, we are able to see what is martensite, and from the phase map, we are able to see what is alsonite. And when you overlap these two maps, you can see the areas that are related to MA constituents. And then from this point, I was measuring manually uh, with um, image J uh, software. Okay. okay, great. So we have a question here from Samuel. Uh, it looks like you also referenced uh, the presentation. So I, I put your presentation up, I shared that. Uh, if you want, I can jump through to a particular slide. Uh, I'll, I'll read that uh, like, question. It yeah. says, which technique uh, did the authors use to establish the pre austenite grain boundaries? Uh, I guess you shared the slide where you show the grain boundaries of the pre austenite uh, over the martensite structure. Um, so, yes, I, use, I show it one of the slides. Um, is I that think, yeah. Uh, the I think the previous one. Can you the the yeah this one we can here see the the Prowse night grain boundary is very clear for the intercritically heated coarse granite heat affected zones because we have uh, these necklace structure and in general you can observe this via uh, SEM. But Xuanxin also showed it in one of her first slides, uh, one very colorful uh, image of the Prowse night grains. And these were generated with the RPGE software based on EBSD uh, maps. Uh, yes, this one. So in this picture on the left corner, uh, these maps were generated with RPGE. And what is the most important here is that we use it, this software also because using this data generated by the RPG software, we can obtain the distribution of grain size, which is different if you just take images from the, from the SEM and you measure an average grain size. And for the modeling side, it's really important to have this distribution of grain size. Very good, thank you. A question came up, uh, and we have a, a wide range of people on the call. We have uh, people from academia as well as industry. So a question here was, can you comment on how your results can impact current industrial practices? Uh, I imagine post-well heat treatments are not an option for the applications that you discussed at the beginning. Yeah, uh, the post-well heat treatments are something interesting and it's usually used. Uh, but we didn't go uh, further in this. But I think what it, it any, can impact the industrial practices is that, well, we see now that if you have very small MA constituents, they will not be so um, detrimental to your microstructure. And then the matrix is the most important. So maybe welding parameters could be adjusted in a way that a combination of microstructural features could bring you not so detrimental behavior of heat affected zones. Okay, great. So there's three questions at the end there. I'll, I'll start with the one that came in at 8.45. Uh, it says, uh, any specific reasons for choosing such a particular heating and cooling rate uh, rates which you have shown in the schematic diagrams? And, don't know yes, if you recall uh, which, uh, which slide that's on. I can jump around if you'd like. Yes, so for the, the thermal profile of the coarse granite heat affected zone was, um, was experimentally measured. So in an actual weld that we performed here in our university in another project. And this uh, profile was used as a basis for the intercritically heated coarse granite heat affected zones. 
So we use it the same um, cooling rate, the same heating rate. We just change it. Well, we just chose different intercritical um, temperatures. And this is something that I don't show here, uh, but we performed other uh, studies in other temperatures as well. So 700, for example, but this temperature was very close to the AC1 or even around AC1. So we didn't observe uh, the presence of MA constituents. So this was not a very interesting temperature to look at. Uh, but yes, it was based on experimental profile. Great. Okay, the next question is during microstructure based modeling, what were the boundary, sorry, let's move down here, what were the boundary uh, conditions during the FEM simulation? Okay, so for this question, I would like to ask the help of uh, Carrie Walters, that it was one of our supervisors in the project. Carrie, could you help us, please? Yeah, can you hear me from, from here? Yes, we can. Ah, very good. Um, so I guess Xu Anqin's presentation is pre-recorded. Yes. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> but uh, I, I think that you're referring to the, uh, uh, the single edge notch bending. And so I believe that that was uh, loaded by having a analytical, analytically rigid cylinder uh, surfaces on the top and then two on the bottom. And then I think that that was uh, also modeled with a quarter symmetry. So there was a symmetry boundary conditions on the center and then on the mid plane. Okay, is that, uh, clear I believe so. So I put that slide up. I think that uh, slide number four in her presentation uh, hopefully shows that as well. Yeah. So maybe I shouldn't have said two uh, two cylinders on the bottom because it's uh, because it's mirrored, but it's mirrored about the center plane there, and then it's mirrored about a, uh, a plane that's halfway through. And then the uh, cylinders you see on the top and on the right are uh, analytical rigid bodies. Great, thank you. The next question, I think this might be the final question. So I think we only have a, a few minutes left anyway, but uh, for the control of the cooling, was there any quenching medium applied or was cooling fully from the grips alone? So was it free cooled or did, did you apply active cooling? Yeah, uh, this is a good question. Uh, no, we didn't need to use, uh, sorry, for the tensile specimens, we didn't use any cooling, but for the, for the CTOD specimens, we use it some air uh, to to help to achieve the cooling rate because yeah, it's a very uh, a, a bulk piece of uh, specimen. So air, did you use air or gas? Yeah, uh, to cool down. Okay, so in an inert gas. Yes. Okay. Uh, and just out of curiosity, so the, the testing that you did run, was it typically in vacuum, uh, high vacuum, or uh, inert gas backfill? No, it was in air. It was not in vacuum or inert gas or anything. It was just in air. Okay. All right, we had a couple of questions here, a couple of comments as well, uh, some some nice comments about your presentations. Uh, people appreciated it, so so thank you. I don't, uh, some of them aren't necessarily questions, just uh, nice comments. So. Uh, let me share those with the group, but uh, but thank you. Actually, thank you to both of our presenters. I think we are just about out of time here. Uh, so I will say if there's more questions for the presenters and, uh, you know, Xuanxin wasn't able to be here to answer questions live. Uh, so if people do have questions about the modeling side, uh, we can make that connection or questions for Virginia. We, uh, you reach out to, the, uh, to me or anyone on the DSI team and we can make an introduction uh, to, to answer those questions. I'll say yes. if anybody has uh, technical questions about the operation of their Gleeble or Gleeble in general, please reach out to our service team or you can reach out to me directly. Uh, we do, for our current customers, we do have a service portal that has uh, a very useful knowledge base and uh, a service ticketing system that's a relatively new system. A lot of our users don't even know about it, uh, but we talk about it each webinar. Uh, so if you are a current user, uh, go onto our website. You can sign up for the, the portal. I would just ask that you use your work email so that we can, it's for customers only, so we want to make sure that you are with that organization. So we, one of the ways we do that is through email. Uh, so sign up and then you can you know, access the knowledge base as well as uh, if you need service or, or support, uh, it's the best way to get that.
Uh, if you have any questions about how we will can support your research, uh, please email our team and we can connect you with an application expert uh, to help you find the, the right solution. Uh, but Virginia and your team there, I want to thank you for presenting uh, great presentations and answering our questions. Uh, really a great job. So thank you. Thank you, Dan. Just one small thing. So in my sure. first uh, in my first slide, you can find the publication that we have on the topic. So if you're interested in knowing more about this publication, you can uh, read this. And also there is also my email. So if you can, if you want to ask more questions or interested, just approach me. Okay. okay? So a long, very much. A long email, it's a long email address. So uh, yes. I, did, <laughs> I did put a link in the, uh, the chat again, so you can download this as a PDF. Uh, also again, that link, that email, an email will go out to everybody that joined uh, with uh, follow up and the video, this video will be up online, uh, hopefully later today, we should be able to get it up there today. Uh, so you can, if you miss something, you can watch it again. Uh, but thanks everyone, I thank you everyone for, for, for joining, we appreciate it and I uh, look forward to seeing you all next month. Thank you. Bye.